Hello and welcome everyone to the Royal Observatory Greenwich's partial solar eclipse stream for 2021. My name is Dr. Greg Brown. I'm going to be your host for today. Uh, we apologise that we've had some technical difficulties over the course of this morning, but everything appears touch word, to be working fine now, so fingers crossed we'll have a great stream for you. Now, in approximately one minute's time, the, uh, the moon is going to start blocking the view of the sun and the eclipse is going to begin, so uh, we will be able to see uh, what we can see through our telescope. Our weather here at the observatory is not ideal. Uh, we have some occasional glimpses of the sun coming through, so we'll be able to see in just a moment whether we're going to be able to see anything or not. So a quick idea of what's going to be happening over the course of today. Obviously, we're going to be bringing you the best view that we possibly can of the partial solar eclipse for today over the course of the next two hours. And we will also be uh, talking about all sorts of things to do with the eclipse, um, from the reasons why astronomers want to study them in the first place to how they've studied them in the past. Um, and we will also be hearing from researchers in the field on how astronomers make use of eclipses even today. Um, and then uh, we're going to be doing that for the first hour of the eclipse. The eclipse is actually going to be lasting about two, two hours, 20 minutes, something along those lines. And for the second half, you're going to be able to see the stream, um, but we won't be actually be uh, talking during that part. So there's going to be a quiet stream where you're going to be able to watch the rest of the stream for as long as you wish until about 25 past 12, which is when we're going to cut the stream entirely. So moment of truth. Let's see, can we actually see the sun through our telescope, first of all? And the answer is unfortunately no. At this exact moment, these clouds are in the way. Looking out my window, I can see clouds are fairly widespread across the sky, but there are gaps in them. So we're going to keep looking at that view as we go. Now, we also hopefully have a view coming from one of our partners, the University of Exeter. Um, and unfortunately, it looks as though things aren't doing too well on their end either. They haven't got a view uh, that we can see. Um, so we will keep uh, apprised on both of those views and we will see what we can see through our telescopes. So let's get started then talking about the eclipse. Why is this an important event in the first place? Well, eclipses are all to do with two very important objects in our sky. The first one is uh, an occasional stranger to the UK, as we have just discovered, our very own sun. So uh, the sun, the source of the light and heat that makes it possible for us to live here on the surface of the Earth, that is the thing which is being blocked by another object in our sky. Very, very occasionally as the moon orbits around the Earth, it will cover the, uh, the surface of the sun. Now, the sun is about 1.4 million kilometers across. It's by far the largest object in our solar system. Uh, the moon, on the other hand, is relatively small, only about three and a half thousand kilometers across which you might then think it's weird that the moon, this tiny, tiny little object, can cover the entirety of the sun. But it's all down to a rather interesting coincidence, and that is that the moon just happens to be about 400 times smaller than the sun, but it's also 400 times closer to the Earth than the sun is. The moon is about 400,000 kilometers away in our skies, and the sun is about one and a, is about 150 million kilometers away. And that works out as almost exactly the right ratio. And as a result, we end up with this situation. As the moon is orbiting around the Earth, and of course the Earth orbiting around the Sun as well, very occasionally in its orbit the Moon will directly come between the Earth and the Sun. And when it does so, the shadow of the Moon is cast onto the surface of the Earth. Anyone who is standing in that shadow will see at least part of the Sun being hidden behind the Moon's surface. 
Now, the shadow of the moon is relatively small, which is one of the reasons why solar eclipses are so much rarer than lunar eclipses. Lunar eclipses, when they occur, can be seen by about half the surface of the planet Earth, because the shadow is on the moon. So as long as you can see the moon, you can see the shadow. But for a solar eclipse, it is only the little bit of the Earth that is directly underneath the Moon that will actually be uh, hidden by the uh, Moon, that will actually be in shadow. Now, this particular eclipse that we have today from the UK is not going to be a total solar eclipse. It's only going to be a partial solar eclipse. So the moon is a little bit too high from our point of view in order for us to be able to actually see uh, the entirety of the sun being covered up. But there are some places around the world which are going to be seeing effectively a total solar eclipse. These are places in uh, northern Canada, Greenland, the Arctic, um, and some places in northeast Russia as well. Now, that's uh, a fairly inaccessible, fairly remote, fairly isolated set of places. So it's not particularly surprising there won't be a huge number of people directly underneath the total eclipse's shadow. And there is an extra thing. The moon isn't always the same distance away from the Earth. Sometimes it's slightly closer, sometimes it is slightly further away. And in this particular case, the moon is slightly too far away from the Earth for it to completely cover the surface of the sun. So even for those people who will be in the path of what's called totality, they're going to see not a total solar eclipse as such, but an annular solar eclipse, so the one that you're seeing on the video right now. So a small amount of the sun's light is going to be able to be visible around the outside of the moon, even for those people who are in the path of totality. Now, we may not be able to see the uh, solar eclipse right at this very moment, but if you are listening from somewhere elsewhere in the UK or perhaps around the rest of the world, then you might be able to see it for yourself. So the question is, how would you go about doing that? Well, the first thing, and a very, very important warning here is, never ever look directly at the sun uh, without something in the way. You need to make certain that you're using very specialised equipment in order to be able to observe the sun if you're going to be looking at it directly. Indirectly is another matter and we'll come to that in just a moment but that means do not look at it directly with your eyes. Do not trust sunglasses. They only take out a small fraction of the light and are nowhere near enough to be able to protect your eyesight when looking at a solar eclipse. Um, and definitely do not look at the sun through a pair of binoculars or a telescope unless it has been specially modified in order to make it safe. Now, one of the most common ways to be able to observe the eclipse would be using a pair of solar eclipse glasses, a little bit like this one here. And these have a solar filter in them that take out a vast, vast fraction of the light coming from the sun, meaning that what little gets through is safe. Now, the important thing here is you need to make certain that these solar eclipse glasses don't have any tears or cracks in the, uh, in the filter itself. Otherwise, again, they won't be blocking the light and uh, you will be putting your eyes at risk. So preferably have new solar eclipse glasses if you possibly can. If you're using old ones, make certain before you use them that they have, uh, that the filter is intact. However, uh, if you don't happen to have a pair of solar eclipse glasses or a specially modified pair of binoculars or telescope with a lovely filter on it, then you can try something a little different. And in fact, we're doing this right here at the Royal Observatory at the moment. Uh, over on the north side, the, uh, one of my colleagues is in fact using a set of pinhole cameras. And these are really quite simple to make. All you need really is just a piece of paper uh, in order to be able to uh, see, uh, in order to be able to um, uh, project onto, and another piece of paper or card preferably that has a tiny dot 
uh, placed through it, so a, uh, a hole made through it. And this is a, uh, the pinhole camera. The idea is it will project the light of the sun onto the surface or uh, onto this um, uh, background that you have. Now, one of the reasons why I'm getting a little bit distracted at the moment is, of course, we actually do have a live view of the sun starting, starting to come through, um, which I can see. As you can see, we are dealing with quite a lot of cloud here at the moment. It keeps coming and going. So unfortunately, it has immediately disappeared. But we will keep that view on the screen so that the moment that it appears, you will be able to see it for yourselves. Unfortunately, this is just the reality of uh, UK weather and particularly of Royal Observatory live streams. So um, if you do want to observe the sun for yourself and you are in a place there where it is nice and sunny, consider a pair of eclipse glasses or a simple pinhole camera. As I say, just a very simple piece of card with a hole uh, uh, punched through it. Very, very small, basically the size of a pinprick. And then you use that to uh, display onto a piece of card below you. And that's a great way to be able to observe it. Uh, you won't be able to see an extremely zoomed in view of the sun, but actually it's remarkably effective. Um, another possibility is if you do happen to own a pair of binoculars or a small telescope. One possibility is if you have a mount that you can put those onto, you could stop down the end of the aperture. Basically what you do is you cover over most of the end of the telescope and leave just a small amount coming through. Now you do need to be careful of this because if you don't uh, re remove enough of the light, you could potentially damage your telescope or pair of binoculars. But again, you are not to look through the telescope or pair of binoculars, that's to be projected onto something else. And then you'll be able to see an image of the sun that way. So uh, we have talked now a little bit about uh, how you'd go about seeing the eclipse. What should you be seeing? Well, we are now 10 minutes into the eclipse. It's going to take about two hours, two hours, 20 minutes, something along those lines, to go from what we call first contact, which is the point where the moon's shadow first intersects with the sun, to the point where the uh, moon's shadow leaves the sun, so the point of last contact. And uh, what you'll be able to see uh, over the course of this time is a small fraction of the sun being cut out over time. It's going to reach its peak in the UK somewhere between about 11.05 and 11.20, somewhere along those sort of lines, depending in what part of the, uh, uh, in what part of the UK you are. Um, for other people around the world, the maximum will vary a little bit, but it will still roughly be somewhere around 11 o'clock BST, somewhere between then and about half 11, a little bit later. Um, so if you want to see it, what you will see is a small chunk of the sun's uh, light being taken out. It's going to go to around about 30% of totality here. So 30% of the light of the sun is going to be cut out of it from the point of view of London. If you are in the northwest, that is the best part of the UK to be able to see it. So if you're in uh, Scotland, parts of Northern Ireland, that sort of place, uh, then you will be able to see potentially up to 40 or even maybe 50% of the sun being cut out by the shadow of the moon. It all depends on where you are and when you're observing it. Um, now, uh, you might be thinking that 30% of the light of the sun being cut out, that's, that's quite a lot. You should be able to notice that uh, in the, uh, the amount of light reaching the surface of the Earth. And technically, you could. But there's a very good chance that a lot of people who may not know that there even is a partial solar eclipse today won't even notice unless they happen to turn on the news or tune into a live stream like this. Because uh, the way that your eyes work is that they are constantly adapting to the light of uh, wherever you happen to be. And because this is such a slow progression uh, over the course of two hours, one hour to get to maximum and then one hour away, then you are going to find it's very, very a slow change. And you're not going to notice so much that the light has changed all that much. In addition, the way our eyes work means that 
big changes in the um, amount of light uh, our eyes receive are required for us to seriously notice um, a change unless we've got something to compare against. So it's not going to be like walking from the sunny outdoors into a slightly darker room. That's an instantaneous change that you'd be able to see quite easily. This is going to be a gradual progression towards about 30% to 50% of the sun being cut out for people in the British Isles. Um, now, uh, you may be wondering uh, how many of these eclipses we actually get. And um, eclipses themselves, total, uh, solar eclipses, aren't altogether rare. You can get about two of them per year, roughly, um, although it can go somewhat higher during certain years. Um, but the fact is that because only the people in the direct shadow of the uh, moon will actually see the eclipse, and that shadow is fairly small, it's actually relatively rare for different parts of the Earth to see them. So the UK has had uh, a number of very small partial eclipses over the course of the last few decades. Uh, we did get a total solar eclipse on August 1999, although that was only visible as a total eclipse in Cornwall and other parts of the southwest. Um, and they had even worse luck than we are having today. They were completely uh, clouded out. So uh, chances are most people will not have seen a thing. Um, I do remember actually observing that one myself from uh, uh, Western France. I was happened to be on holiday at the time. And there it was only a partial solar eclipse, about 60%, I seem to remember, uh, roughly. But the weather was nice, so at least I could see it. So that was something. And um, we did also get another partial eclipse uh, in March of 2015. Um, and that time it did get up to 80% of totality basically across the entirety of the British Isles, which was a pretty good, um, good, pretty good one. And 80% is quite a lot of light to be taken out. So that one you probably would have noticed that it got a little darker and a little chillier as time was going on. Now, unfortunately, we uh, still are not getting anything through our telescope. I'm just going to switch over to Exeter's view and see if maybe, maybe they've got something coming through as well. Um, the feed appears to be black from our point of view. Uh, I very much hope that that's due to uh, weather and not technical problems. Although then again, that would mean that Exeter themselves aren't seeing it either. So perhaps let's hope not for that either. So. Um, Let's talk then about uh, how we're going to be observing the eclipse if we're lucky and the clouds do get out of our way. We are here in the Altazimuth Pavilion, that is one of the buildings here on the site at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. And we are observing the eclipse with our Animonda Astrographic Telescope. And to tell you more about that, uh, we have Hannah Banyard, one of our astronomers here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. Hello everyone, my name is Hannah Banyard, I'm an astronomer at the Royal Observatory Greenwich and I'm going to be operating the telescope today for our solar eclipse live stream. So we thought it'd be a good idea to show you some of the equipment that we'll be using today. I'm at the Altazimuth Pavilion here at the observatory with our Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope, named after Annie Maunder. Annie Maunder was an Irish solar astronomer who worked here at the observatory from the late 19th century. She organised solar eclipse expeditions around the world and even photographed the sun's atmosphere. She was also one of the first women to become a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, so I can't think of any better telescope to use when we're trying to observe a solar eclipse today. The Annie Astrographic Telescope, or AMAT for short, is made up of several different telescopes, but today we're going to be using the Lunt Solar Scope. It's a four inch telescope. We don't need a telescope that's too large because the sun is quite a big object in our sky, but we do need to use a special telescope because it is a solar scope. We can't just point any regular telescope at the sun because it would damage the equipment. Just in the same way that if you look directly at the sun with your eyes, which please never do, it will damage your eyesight. So our Lunt solar scope has a combination of special filters. It's got a blocking filter, which blocks out most of the sun's light, and it has a hydrogen alpha or H alpha filter, which only lets a very narrow bandwidth of visible light
light through your telescope. The hydrogen alpha filter is really useful for astronomers because it allows us to see certain features of the sun's atmosphere, such as the granular texture and other layers of the atmosphere, such as the chromosphere. Now, we can use an eyepiece to look through our telescope, but that wouldn't be very useful for you all watching at home. So instead, we've got a camera hooked up to our telescope, which is then hooked up to our computer out on the other side of the dome, so we can share the live footage with you all. Now, we really encourage you, if you can, to head outside and take a look at the eclipse, but only if you've got special solar eclipse glasses. They have a special filter, much like our telescopes, to make sure that your eyes don't get damaged. For those of you who don't have any solar eclipse glasses, though, don't worry. We aim to give you the best possible view of the partial solar eclipse from here at the Royal Observatory, Greenwich. Hannah Banyard there, one of the astronomers here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. And in fact, she is right next to me, uh, operating the telescope at the moment. Um, unfortunately, as you can see, we still are not getting anything through. We did very, very briefly have a view of the sun earlier. Um, but unfortunately, our clouds are not playing ball for us, which is a real shame. Okay, so uh, let's now talk a little bit about why eclipses are um, important uh, to astronomers. Um, but before we do, actually, I've just remembered, um, uh, all the way through this stream, you can send questions in through YouTube and through Facebook, and we will answer them live on the stream uh, whenever we can. And we have, in fact, had one question come through um, asking, would it be safe to use a tablet front camera and watch it on the screen? So point the telescope, uh, point the, uh, the tablet at the sun um, and view it on the screen. Um, it would be safe from the point of view of um, as long as you are not looking in the same direction as the sun and accidentally the tablet comes down too far and you, you end up looking straight into the sun, that would be bad. If you're looking at it at an angle, sure, it would be safe. And um, the problem is that uh, tablets, uh, uh, cam uh, normal cameras, uh, just aren't really designed to look at something so incredibly bright. So uh, it's not entirely clear whether you would actually be able to see uh, the disk of the sun and not just massive glare across the entirety of your screen. Um, there is also the danger potentially, it's not likely to happen, but it is potentially uh, possible that if you point a tablet at the sun and the, the camera is looking at it for a long period of time that that could potentially damage the camera as I say it's unlikely but it is something that you do need to be aware of so if you do want to try to use a tablet uh, or a, uh, a smartphone or something along those sort of lines make certain that you are observing at a glancing angle so that you're not looking directly into the path of the sun in case the tablet or phone moves out of the way um, and do be aware that uh, there is no guarantee that you will actually be able to see uh, the sun coming through. These cameras just aren't designed for such something so incredibly bright. Um, okay, so uh, what is it that makes uh, eclipses so special, makes them so important? Well, we have been observing eclipses as uh, humans for an extremely long time, uh, ever since we've been able to notice that every now and then the sun gets blocked off by something. And over the course of human history, all sorts of explanations have been provided for what could be causing this. Um, in uh, some cultures, it was uh, deemed that the, the moon was actually being eaten by a, a vast beast in the sky. Um, in certain, uh, in the Mayan culture, certainly eclipses were extremely important and uh, thought to be uh, sort of the beginnings and ends of ages of the Earth. And also, uh, we also have um, uh, situations far more, far more recently where uh, eclipses are just seen sort of portents of doom. Um, they're very unusual things that happen at strange times and uh, to a certain person that would be seen as a, 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 a potentially a portent of either a great thing or a very terrible thing, usually for the king or queen of the time just like uh, comet sightings and, uh, and supernovae that have been observed have also been seen as the same sort of idea. 
Um, but from a scientific perspective, eclipses are a fascinating look into the sun and the ability to see the sun. Because uh, the sun is a difficult object to observe. It's extremely bright, which means that uh, observing it with a, a normal camera is very, very difficult. And that means that we need to resort to other methods. Now we can put filters onto our cameras um, as we are in fact doing with our animal to astrographic telescope today uh, in order to be able to reduce the amount of light coming from the sun. But that can only get us so far. And in the past, observing the much, much fainter outer regions of the sun, the atmosphere of the sun, was basically impossible unless an eclipse was taking place. So, in order to talk a little bit about the importance of eclipses in the past and also to answer the question of why it is that our telescope is called the Animonda Astrographic Telescope in the first place, uh, we are going to be uh, listening to an interview that I had with Dr. Louise DeVoy, Senior Curator here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. So today we are going to be making use of the Animonda Astrographic Telescope. That's the telescope we're going to be using to observe the partial solar eclipse. But why exactly is it called the Animonda Astrographic Telescope? And who was this person? Why was she so important? Today we're talking to Dr. Louise DeVoy, the Senior Curator at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. Hello, Louise. Hi, Greg. Thanks Thank for inviting me. Thank you for being here. So, um, who exactly was Animonda? Sure, so Annie Maunder, or Annie Scott Dill Russell, as she was originally known, was one of the first women to be employed here at the observatory in the 1890s. And over the next few years, she became a real expert in solar photography and in measuring the position, size, and motion of sunspots. Now, we've had lots of generations of assistants and astronomers here at the observatory over the past 300 years. But for me, I think Annie really stands out, not just because of the, the challenges that she faced on account of her gender, but also for her pioneering astrophotography work and also her passion for really sharing astronomy with as many people as possible, just like we still do today. So it's really great to name this telescope in her honour, share her story and really continue that legacy. Now, it's quite unusual for, for women to be employed in science, even in astronomy, uh, at that time. So what was her role? What was she actually doing? So Annie was one of four women known as lady computers who were hired by the 8th Astronomer Royal William Christie in the early 1890s. And at that time, Christie had just committed the observatory to take part in a project known as the Cup de Ciel, or Map of the Sky in French. And this was a big project organised by Paris Observatory in which a network of about 20 observatories around the globe were allocated a certain part of the sky. And it was their job to photograph that section and then stitch all those images together to create a complete photographic sky atlas. Now, as you can imagine, it was a really ambitious project that needed a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of labour. And so hiring these four lady computers was a really good way of keeping on track with taking the photographs and doing the number crunching or data reduction afterwards. So these four women were all Cambridge mathematics graduates, but sadly they were only paid the same rate as teenage boys who just left school. They didn't get nearly the, nowhere near the same amount as their male graduate counterparts. But because it was such a rare and unusual opportunity for women to work professionally in astronomy, these ladies were more than happy to do the job, and Annie was one of them. So Annie's role early on was uh, quite tedious, a bit on the boring side, um, uh, but her role certainly evolved as time went on, didn't it? Absolutely. So Annie originally started on the Carte de Ciel project, but as we look through the records, we can see that Christie realises that he can use these ladies in other departments across the observatory site. And on the 4th of September 1892, we start to see the initials AR, Annie Russell, against the ledgers of the sunspot observations. So Annie had been transferred to the heliographic or solar photography department, if you like, and this was headed by a gentleman called Walter Maunder, who had been working in the department since the 1870s. Uh, at that time, the observatory had been involved in the transit Venus expeditions for 1874, and it had purchased five of these very specialist uh, heliographic telescopes, 
one of which remained here after the expedition, and that was what was used for these daily observations of the sun. So essentially, photoheliograph is a long telescope with a four inch aperture lens and a sort of camera box attached to the bottom. And Annie and Walter would take these very rapid photographs, just a fraction of a second exposure time to capture the solar disk. And then they'd take the plate, put it on another instrument and then accurately measure the positions of the sunspots and look for any trends in the data over the days, months and years of the collection. Now this working relationship between Annie and Walter blossomed into friendship and then into romance and eventually the couple married in December 1895. But unfortunately, according to the civil service and government rules of the day, and also I guess that the social conventions, married women were not allowed to work, so Annie had to give up her job in order to marry Walter. Now this seems quite shocking to our, our modern ears, but I think actually as we look at Annie's journey after that event, it really gave her quite a bit of freedom as well to do what she wanted and to look at other areas of astronomy. And in particular, it gave her a lot of time to devote her energies to the British Astronomical Association. Uh, both Annie and Walter were very passionate about sharing astronomy with a, a wide audience. And unlike the elite organisations like the Royal Society or the Royal Astronomical Society, the BAA was open to anyone, male, female, professional, amateur, upper class, lower class, anyone who was interested in astronomy. And so they really dedicated their lives to publications, to presenting public lectures about astronomy and organising eclipse expeditions all through their involvement with the BAA. So you mentioned that she had a hand in some of the solar eclipse expeditions. Now solar eclipses, uh, as we'll already have heard by this point, are really quite difficult to see. They're only visible in very small regions of the Earth whenever they occur. So uh, how exactly was Annie involved in these expeditions to see them? So eclipse expeditions were a really important of Annie and Walter's involvement with the British Astronomical Association and they also gave Annie a really great opportunity to experiment with her skills in solar photography. So she was already used to taking these daily photographs of the solar disk to measure sunspots, but with totality, with a total solar eclipse, you can really start to see the, the outer atmosphere of the sun and she really wanted to try and capture that. So in 1897, Annie managed to secure a grant from her old college at Cambridge, Burton College, and she used this to purchase a lens that originally was intended to be used as a sort of wise angle lens, ideal for photographing, say, the Milky Way. But she realised that she could also use that to try and capture eclipses as well. So in January 1898, Annie and Walter travelled to Talmi in India to view the eclipse there, and this gave Annie the opportunity to capture the longest coronal streamer on a photograph at that time. The streamer itself extended for about five or seven times the diameter of the moon across the sky. It was a truly spectacular photograph and uh, it said that when Annie presented her results to the BAA, the whole audience just erupted into applause. Everyone really appreciated how much skill and technique she'd used to capture that. Then a few years later, in 1901, in Mauritius, she managed to capture a photograph of the solar corona, the outer atmosphere of the sun. And in that picture, you can really start to see some of the plumes and the rays, some of those really detailed structures uh, that hadn't really been captured before. So two remarkable achievements. And what I really like is when you go through her eclipse reports, you can see how she's really sort of dabbling and trying different ideas. She's adjusting the cameras, she's trying different photographic plates covered in different emulsions, different brands. She's also tweaking the exposure time, too little and you don't get enough detail, too much and you get glare, or else you get the actual movement of the moon over the surface of the solar disk. So you can really see her sort of trying her skills and developing her knowledge, it's, it's really fascinating. In the modern day, we're really used to seeing beautiful images of space, lots of brilliant astrophotographic images. But this was really early in the development of the camera. Just how pioneering was Annie's work? I think Annie's work was really quite extraordinary, um, both in terms of developing her own cameras, designing her own equipment. She had to rely on borrowing a lot of telescopes and mounts and cameras from various people and organisations. So, it was really hard, hard work and a big effort for her. 
So I think it, it just makes you appreciate even more how she was trying to, to tweak those details of astrophotography to create these really remarkable images. Well, we can't promise to produce any pioneering images for today, but hopefully we'll be able to see a good view of the partial solar eclipse. Dr. Louise DeVoy, thank you very much. A good view of the partial solar eclipse seems to be passing us by at the moment. You may have spotted just a moment ago that the clouds did begin to part and then rather annoyingly have gone back on uh, to our view. So just if you're joining us, this is the Royal Observatory Greenwich's uh, live stream of the partial solar eclipse 2021. Uh, my name is Dr. Greg Brown. I'm your host for today. And uh, throughout today, we are going to be in the background having our live view from the Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. You were just listening to uh, Dr. Louise DeVoy, Senior Curator of the Royal Observatory Greenwich, talking about uh, Annie Maunder, uh, an absolutely fantastic woman working here at the turn of the 20th century, and uh, her work, pioneering work on astrophotography and also on solar eclipses. So going out to observe solar eclipses was extremely important. It was one of the only ways that we could actually see certain parts of the sun at the time. Um, and making those observations required uh, sending out expeditions to various different parts of the world in order to be able to see them. And one of the most important eclipse expeditions came a few years later. Um, in 1914, 1915, uh, a name that you will probably recognize, Albert Einstein produced his theories of general relativity. And it was these theories that were trying to understand the way that gravity works in our universe. Um, up until then, everyone had basically been following the view of Sir Isaac Newton from a few hundred years previously um, and his uh, ideas of how gravity worked. And uh, there were important problems with the way that Newton uh, Newton's understanding of gravity. Albert Einstein's view uh, sorted out many of those issues, but we needed a test. A test to be able to see if uh, Einstein's theories were in fact correct. And only four years later, in 1919, an expedition was uh, set out by uh, Frank Dyson and Arthur Eddington out to actually observe an eclipse because of something very specific that gravity does to light. Gravity is a bending of space-time, and because light and everything else in the universe is bound to that space-time, the fabric of the universe, it has to follow any curvature, any distortion in space. And that means that it has to follow the distortion due to gravity made by the sun. So, if you were to observe a solar eclipse, then you would potentially be able to see stars that you wouldn't normally be able to see because they'd be behind the disk of the sun. But because of the bending of light around the outside of the sun, the image of that star would shift off to one side and be visible. Now, the shift uh, due to the uh, gravity of the sun isn't particularly strong, which is why we didn't see anything quite like that. But this image taken in 1919 by that very expedition uh, actually shows all sorts of wonderful things. First of all, we can see the eclipse nice and clearly. We can see the atmosphere of the sun around the outside as well. This is a, a much fainter, but actually much, much hotter part of the sun. We can even see a huge uh, loop of plasma being strewn off the surface of the sun and reconnecting back onto the surface again. So that's all absolutely fantastic. But what Dyson and Eddington were interested in at the time was what was going on around the sun. They were looking at the positions of the stars as they should be where they were normally compared with where they appeared to be for the sun. And although it's very, very difficult to see, the closer the stars were to the sun, the more they were shifted away from the position that they should be in the night sky. This was proof, or at least strong evidence, that Einstein's theories of general relativity were in fact correct. 
Now, I'm just going to take a moment to answer some of the questions that we've had coming in to our stream. Remember, you can send in questions at any time using uh, the Facebook chat or YouTube's chat function, and we will answer as many of those questions as we can during this stream. So. The first question that we have here um, is a very pertinent one for our, uh, what we've got happening at the moment. Uh, if it's cloudy, will we see the effect of the darkness? So as I said earlier on in the stream, the sun is going to be blocked out to a certain extent depending on where you are. If you happen to be in the northern reaches of Canada, Greenland, certain parts of the Arctic and uh, northeast Russia, then you might get to almost totality. A small ring of light will be visible, that's what's known as an annular eclipse. Um, but if you're outside of those regions, then you will see a certain fraction of the sun being covered as long as you are close enough to those regions. For the, so for the UK, that's going to be somewhere between 25 and 50% of the sun is going to be blocked by the moon at some point during this eclipse. Now, as I mentioned earlier, because of the way that our eyes work, it's actually quite difficult for us to notice the change in the light level that occurs during the eclipse. Our eyes are designed to change uh, the uh, size of our pupils, change their response whenever it gets dark. And that's why um, uh, we can uh, sit in a, a reasonably well-lit room and then go outside, notice that things become extremely bright in the bright sunshine and then things begin to relax and sort themselves out and it doesn't feel so bright anymore. That's, that, that's our eyes uh, changing to the, the situation. But that's a very instantaneous change for a solar eclipse. This change is happening over the course of an hour or two, so it's very, very gradual, it's quite difficult to see. Add in the clouds, as this question asks, and it becomes very, very difficult to see indeed, especially as the sun is constantly popping in and out of the clouds at the moment. It's going to be very, very difficult for you to notice that actually it's getting darker or brighter as we come out of the eclipse on the other side. Now, I'm just being uh, told that we might be about to have a view of the sun coming through. Possibly not. I'm also getting uh, shaking of heads every now and then as well. So uh, hopefully the sun is going to appear sometime very soon. Now, um, another question that we've had is, uh, does the eclipse change the temperature of our atmosphere? And actually, that is a fantastic question. The answer is yes, absolutely. It will very slightly change the temperature of uh, the region around uh, you. So um, in the uh, eclipse that happened, the partial eclipse that happened in March 2015, um, I did in fact notice that it got quite a bit chillier. But then again, it was quite cold to begin with. Now I'm just going to stop what I'm saying because we are getting a view finally of the eclipse coming through uh, on our screen. So this is the sun, apparently it's not going to last very long, this is the sun with the view of the moon, uh, the shadow of the moon on the right hand side. I'm afraid it's already gone. This is unfortunately the re reality of working with uh, a, a subject that requires the weather to be good. But for a very brief moment there we did have a view of the solar eclipse. I apologise that it was very, very brief, but we are at um, a roundabout, we're, we're heading towards um, the maximum eclipse that we are going to get here in uh, London. That's going to occur at 10 past 11. So we've got about 20 minutes left until we reach the, the um, highest point of uh, the, the eclipse, the maximum of the eclipse that we are going to see from here. If you're in the northwest, that might occur just a little bit later. Um, but uh, the, uh, at the moment, this is the view that we have. Um, so, uh, what was I saying? I was talking about uh, some of the uh, questions that are coming in. So, yes, we had a question that says, um, uh, does the eclipse change the temperature of our atmosphere? And actually, that's a very excellent question uh, that leads me straight into the thing which I'm going to be presenting for you now. Why are eclipses still important to observers today? Why are astronomers still interested in eclipses? Because the thing is, we actually have a, a wide range of different telescopes, a wide range of different satellites orbiting around the Earth and the Sun, taking images in all sorts of different types of light. So is an eclipse really necessary anymore? Well, I was talking to Professor Christopher Scott of the University of Reading about just that subject. 
So, so far we've heard quite a lot about the historical perspective of how eclipses have been important in the past, but are they still important to researchers today? Professor Christopher Scott is a uh, researcher at the University of Reading, and he's kindly agreed to talk to us about that today. Hello, Chris. Hi. So um, one of the things that you actually work in is something called space weather. Now, some of the people listening at home might find that a little bit peculiar. After all, space is a vacuum. So uh, how can there be weather in space? Well, it all comes down to our sun. Uh, our sun is a star, it's a variable star, and uh, it's constantly kicking out material into space, like the steam rising off a, a saucepan of boiling water. And that material is known as the solar wind, and the Earth sits inside the solar wind. Now, occasionally, the sun um, and its magnetic field get sufficiently tangled up with itself that it erupts a big burst of uh, material known as a coronal mass ejection. It's a, it's a dull name for an astonishing thing. It's a billion tons of material traveling about a million miles an hour. And if one of those things comes towards Earth, it can really uh, impact our modern technological infrastructure. So we have satellites for communication and navigation, etc. So we need to protect those assets. But also this energy can get into the Earth's magnetic field. It can cause currents to run in the Earth's atmosphere and those can can cause excess currents to flow through our power grid. So we need to know when these events are happening so that we can protect all this, we can, we can mitigate the, the, the circumstances. And so forecasting when the sun is going to produce one of these eruptions is the, the challenge. And it has many comparisons with, with terrestrial weather. We have a, a climate, there's a climate in space that varies over long periods of time. And there's also weather. There are these, these impulsive events which can cause disruption if we're not prepared for them. And the, uh, it's, it's not all bad news when it comes to space weather, is it? Because the, there's, there's one particular event that happens on uh, every planet in the solar system that's, that's caused by this space weather, these uh, aurorae, which are particularly interesting to study as well. Yeah, well, if you've got a, a planet with an atmosphere and it has to have a magnetic field as well, then the magnetic field can't concentrate all the particles uh, from the solar winds. Um, and um, but they're not necessarily from the solar wind, that's a sticky point, but, mm. but it concentrates that energy to the north and south poles, and through the interaction with the solar wind, these energetic particles get thrown into the atmosphere and cause it to glow, and that's what is the aurora. So we've seen aurora now, obviously on the Earth, and on Jupiter, and on Saturn, which are quite spectacular because of the size of the planet, and particularly with Jupiter, because it has a very strong magnetic field. And the analogy I always used to use was an old fashioned television screen where you would be firing electrons as a phosphor screen that would then glow. But with the advent of LCD screens, that, that analogy is out the window now. But the, yeah. the, the atmosphere of a planet is like, the, like an old fashioned television screen. If you throw energetic particles into it, it glows. And that, that can be really spectacular. So how exactly do eclipses actually help in modern day research and particularly in the research that you do? Well, my research uh, is involved with the Earth's ionosphere. That's the electric, electrified part of the Earth's upper atmosphere, right on the edge of space. When you have a solar eclipse, it's the nearest thing we get in environmental physics to a controlled experiment. We can actually switch off the sun for a moment and see what the impact that has on the ionosphere and, and how uh, it behaves. Now, previously in history, um, people have been looking at uh, these the ionospheric response to a solar eclipse because it helped them understand the sort of chemistry that was going on in the upper atmosphere long before we had rockets and satellites capable of making direct measurements. Um, so they, 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 were, they were very vogue. People would do ionospheric eclipses, uh, measurements of the ionosphere during an eclipse from about 1935 onwards. Um, and their experiments didn't work because a lot of the radiation that actually ionizes the, the, uh, the ionosphere comes from beyond the limb of the sun. So it isn't actually blocked off during a solar eclipse. But what they had done was that they had recorded the brightness of the solar corona. So the, 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 the very hot um, atmosphere around the sun. And so if you actually compare the relative brightness of eclipses throughout time, it shows you how that corona has grown and shrunk with the solar cycle. And so these historic measurements um, recorded something that they weren't expecting to, but nevertheless were, were very helpful. One thing that we have, of course, today is uh, a whole suite of different instruments orbiting around the sun. Uh, we have coronagraphs here on Earth enable us to study the sun uh, without there being an eclipse at the time. Uh, do eclipses 
truly still help us? Can, can we actually learn something more from them that we can't do somehow with modern day technology? Well, certainly in my own field, the answer is, is yes. Um, now we can have an eclipse and we can study it with the ionosphere, but we can also calibrate that using uh, the spacecraft data in the um, in, in orbit around the, the sun or, or parked at various places to, to observe the sun. And we, what we're interested in with the sun, we know that it does, it's not a static star, it does, it does vary with this 11 year cycle and it has longer um, um, periods of, of, of variation in its activity too. So we, people talk about grand solar maxima and grand solar minima. And so by looking back at the uh, response of eclipses uh, before the, the space age, it, it tells us how that uh, has, uh, how the sun has changed over that time. And so by able to, being able to calibrate with modern spacecraft data, the observations we see today, it helps us interpret those uh, previous observations. And we care because we expect a big space weather event, a severe extreme space weather event about once every hundred years. And, space weather sits in the same box in the government risk register as, a, as an emergent pandemic. So um, we can all see the sort of impact that, that that sort of thing can have on society. But we can mitigate some of the risks of space weather, we can protect our power grids, we can protect our spacecraft and our modern infrastructure if we're ready for it. And, and so we don't have 100 years worth of spacecraft data, but we do have proxies that we can use to infer things about what was going on in space. And ionospheric measurements of eclipses are a very useful resource in that regard. Now, of course, the uh, thing about today's eclipse is that from the UK, it's only a partial eclipse from uh, a large fraction of the part of the world that will actually see any of it. It's only a partial eclipse, which is fairly standard for a total, uh, for a total solar eclipse. Um, but this one is also an annular eclipse, which means that not the entirety of the surface of the sun is going to be covered, even from those few regions that actually have a total eclipse. So is this one actually going to be useful for eclipse studies and given that the main place that people are going to be able to see it is uh, over the arctic northern canada that sort of place is anyone actually going to be there to observe it well scientifically going over the arctic um, might seem like an obscure place to be but that's of course where the world scientists have all their radars and instrumentation waiting to observe the aurora. So um, it's bristling with, with instrumentation that could actually view the response of the ionosphere to this eclipse. And so in that respect, even though it's in a, in a fairly um, remote uh, location, uh, that there will be a lot of instrumentation able to, to make measurements of this eclipse and, and add to our understanding of, of how the sun affects our atmosphere. Now, one thing that we're uh, a really big fan of here at the Royal Observatory is citizen science, people being able to get involved um, in science uh, from their own home. Um, and you've actually been involved in a particular citizen science program uh, over the years concerning eclipse studies. Can you tell us a little bit more about that one? Um, and what is it that, that people at home can actually do? And is there any way for them to get involved? Well, during the last partial eclipse over the UK, which was about 90% eclipse, so that's quite majorly uh, covered, um, we set an experiment up to look to see if we could detect any changes in temperature on the ground as a result of that eclipse. Prior to that, in the total eclipse in 1999, uh, we took uh, our ionospheric radar down to Cornwall to sit under the path of the uh, total eclipse. And uh, for anyone that remembers the 1999 uh, total solar eclipse, it rained, it was very, very overcast. But our radar, of course, wasn't affected by the weather. We were able to carry on making observations of the ionosphere and we were able to, to, to make measurements of brightness of the solar corona um, during that event. So, um, and in conjunction with that uh, experiment, we asked people to listen out for a Spanish radio station that you would normally only hear at night when the ionosphere is a uh, very weak low down and you get reflections off the higher layer of the ionosphere. And of course, during an eclipse, you'd expect those nighttime um, conditions to reappear momentarily. And so by logging the time that they started to hear Radio La Coruña appear uh, over the UK again, we were able to actually make a map of where the shadow was. Uh, and that was quite interesting, just using commercial radio stations to track the radio. And now, Chris, what we've seen here today has been a, um, a little bit of a preview, basically, of, of something that you're uh, going to be doing for us just a little bit later. So on the 18th of June, uh, we have our summer solstice lecture. Um, and uh, Professor Chris Scott has kindly agreed to, uh, to take 
that for us. So uh, um, are you looking forward to your lecture, Chris? <laughs> I always love talking about the research, <laughs> so well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very good to hear. Uh, tickets for that are available on our website, so please do have a look. The, uh, email, uh, the address will be on your screen right now. Professor Chris Scott, thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. That was Professor Christopher Scott from the University of Reading talking to us about uh, the modern day importance of eclipses and how uh, we are using them to extend our uh, excellent modern day data back into the past over the course of the last 100 years. Um, if you are interested in going to that summer lecture, the link to it is in fact on the screen at the moment, and I'm sure it will be posted in various different places on our website and also uh, possibly in the uh, chat of the stream as well. Uh, now, uh, during that, perhaps you would have noticed that we were getting the occasional glimpse of the sun coming through the clouds are uh, really trying to stop us from being able to see anything today uh, with our observations. But uh, every so often we are getting a glimpse coming through. Um, so uh, while we're waiting for uh, the, uh, the eclipse to be visible to us again, it's time to ask uh, some more of your questions. Again, if you do want to ask a question, do drop it into the Facebook chat or to the YouTube chat, depending on which one you are uh, watching, and we will answer as many of them as we can throughout our stream. Um, so the next uh, question that we've got, uh, so we've already answered one on, uh, does the eclipse change the temperature of our atmosphere? And as Professor Christopher Scott just pointed out, the answer is absolutely yes. And in fact, that's actually quite useful to uh, understanding uh, the models that we have of our atmosphere and testing those with um, an experiment. Um, the next question we have is, uh, if we need to protect our eyes with solar eclipse glasses during eclipses, then what happens to our eyes during bigger solar flares? Now, I'm going to work under the assumption that this is referring to you have the eclipse glasses on and then a flare appears. And the answer is, you'd be fine, basically. Um, the sun is extraordinarily bright. And don't get me wrong, solar flares and coronal mass ejections can be extremely bright as well but they're still only a tiny, tiny fraction of the brightness of the sun. You can look at uh, the sun as it normally is with a pair of solar eclipse glasses um, without doing any damage to your eyes, as long as they are um, complete and relatively new so that the, the solar filter hasn't become damaged. So adding a few percent to the brightness of the sun because there's been a big solar flare isn't going to be too much of a problem. If instead you're referring to solar flares generally um, outside of eclipses and the, the solar flare streaming potentially towards the Earth, which could be quite dangerous for our electrical systems in particular, uh, the answer is we probably wouldn't notice with our own eyes. Again, the sun is an extremely bright object. The flare that would be coming towards us would be very, very uh, um, um, faint in comparison and very, very diffuse. So that is spread out by the time that it got to us. So that wouldn't be a solar flare. That would be a coronal mass ejection, which is billions upon billions of tons of material being chucked off the surface of the sun. Our sun is a very, very active place. But all of that stuff spreads out. The danger is not directly to human health. It is uh, indirectly through the uh, effect that it might have on electrical systems. There have been instances in the past, um, in particular, the uh, Carrington event of 1849, 1850, something along those sort of lines, um, when electricity was still very early on in its existence, but it did exist. Um, and uh, telegraph operators were able to either operate their, uh, the telegraphs without the um, thing being switched on, on uh, onto the power grid, just because of the current being induced in the cables between those two telegraph operators by the coronal mass ejection. Now, we haven't had anything anywhere near that big um, in about the last 150 years. Uh, there have been a few near misses, but nothing major. And we are taking steps to be able to protect our our electrical infrastructure and the satellites in orbit around us to make certain that if one does occur, fingers crossed, we won't have any issues. 
The next question we've got is, uh, will we be able to see a ring of fire? So a ring of fire is an absolutely fantastic thing to be able to see. Um, it is the last moment of totality in uh, a solar eclipse where the entirety of the sun has been blocked by the moon. And so you just see a very, very, very small amount of light around the outside of the uh, uh, the moon's shadow there. Now the answer is, if you're living in the UK, uh, no, we won't unfortunately be able to see it. It's only going to be a partial solar eclipse from here, about 30 to 50% at maximum. Um, so you won't be able to see a ring of fire, but again, with, some, uh, with a pair of uh, solar eclipse glasses, uh, with uh, a projection, you would be able to see that chunk being cut out of the moon. If, however, you are in the path of totality of this solar eclipse, that is, northern reaches of Canada, Greenland, parts of the Arctic or northeast Russia, some of the most isolated places on the planet, but nonetheless, a few people hanging around there. And then, yes, you would be able to see a form of a ring of fire. Instead of seeing just the very outer part of the atmosphere of the sun, because this is what's going to be called an annular eclipse, which is where the moon's shadow is slightly too small to cover the entirety of the sun, you will actually see a ring around the outside, which is the uh, solar eclipse, uh, which is a little bit of the surface of the sun still visible to us. So uh, do be aware that even if you are observing this with um, in the path of totality, there is not going to be a point during this eclipse when you can take off the protection of your solar eclipse glasses. That's not usually a good idea to do even in a totality situation where the entirety of the sun is covered up because it could come back at any moment. But certainly with an annular eclipse or a partial solar eclipse, you cannot take away the safety of those uh, solar eclipse glasses this time round. Uh, another question is, can Eclipse be photographed? And that is an absolutely fantastic question to go into the next thing that I'm going to be talking about because astrophotography is a really big part of what we do here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. Every year we run the uh, Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition. We are now uh, 12, 13, 14 years into this competition now. We've been going for quite a while and the array of images that we get is absolutely fantastic. Um, and the sun, our sun, is one particular category in that uh, competition. And we've had numerous images taken of the sun, whether during an eclipse or outside of it, that have absolutely been uh, incredibly spectacular. And I'd love to share just a few of them with you right now. So the first image that we have here is from uh, Nicolas Lefadou. Uh, he is a, a, a person who has entered a number of times into our competition. Competition. He, in fact, won last year's competition with a tilt image of the uh, Andromeda galaxy. But here is an absolutely fantastic image that he took um, in 2018, if I remember correctly, um, or the year preceding, at least, uh, the, the competition of 2018, of a total solar eclipse. And it is absolutely stunning. Um, if you can see it in full resolution as well, those images are all up on uh, our website and uh, plastered all over the internet because they're so absolutely fantastic and spectacular to see, then you'll actually see that not only can you see some stars in the background, in fact in this particular image you can also see uh, Mars, it's actually off the, cr uh, the crop that I've done for this particular image, but there is a small tiny red dot and that is uh, Mars in the image as well. Um, we also have the atmosphere of the sun around the outside, lots and lots of spikes of this corona, the outer layers of the sun, nice and visible. But what's absolutely fantastic is that he's been able to take an image that has the uh, near side of the moon visible in it as well. So normally when we look up at the moon during this period of the moon's movement around the earth called new moon, we will be able to see nothing because none of the light from the sun is reaching the surface of the moon that we can see. But a small amount of light is hitting the earth, bouncing up to the moon and then bouncing back down again. And this relay of light bouncing forwards and backwards known as Earthshine is just enough to be able to take images 
of the near side of the moon even when it's dark, which is absolutely fantastic. And in this particular image, uh, Nicholas has been able to uh, combine a solar eclipse and being able to see the Earth shine moon at the same time. Absolutely wonderful. Another image which actually won um, the 2016 competition here uh, was this. This is another Im set of images of a total solar eclipse. This is uh, by Yu Jun, and uh, this is called Bailey's Beads. Now, Bailey's Beads is a uh, phenomenon that occurs during a solar eclipse. Basically, the very last moment before you reach totality, with the sun being completely covered up by the shadow of the moon, you get just a tiny little glimpse of the sun, the surface of the sun appearing at one edge of the moon. And this is sometimes known as the diamond ring effect, because it will look a little bit like you can see the, the outside of the ring, which is uh, the sun's atmosphere, and then just a tiny little dot of the sun's surface as it's been uh, swallowed up by the shadow of the moon. Um, and uh, this is Bailey's Beads, is, the, uh, is a run of images taken as the diamond ring effect is disappearing and then reappearing as the moon goes from um, uh, totally covering the sun to uh, being visible again. So another absolutely brilliant image um, uh, entered into our Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition, uh, that time in 2016. And then we have an image just of the surface of the sun. And this shows some of the features that we've been talking about in today's live stream, particularly that uh, Professor Christopher Scott was talking about earlier. Um, this uh, shows the, the constantly boiling over surface of the sun, thousands and thousands of degrees Celsius is the surface of the sun, about five and a half thousand degrees Celsius. Um, and that means that the gas is constantly boiling, changing, moving around, uh, a bit like water boiling in a kettle. And on top of that, occasionally you get dark dark spots appearing on the surface of the sun, known as sunspots. Uh, these sunspots are uh, areas of activity on the surface of the sun, magnetic activity, making the surface of the sun just a little bit colder in those regions and making it just a tiny little bit darker. And uh, this image, taken by Alexandra Hart for our 2014 competition, uh, was the winner of the Sun category, uh, the Our Solar System category back then, and the Our Sun category is a more recent addition. And here is Alexandra talking about her passion for solar observation. I work as a scientist in prostate cancer research. I can see cells behaving in a certain way and nobody has ever seen that before and you just get this inner excitement and I think it's exactly the same when I come home the sun is putting on a show just for me it is like an addiction it's definitely an addiction I can spend a whole morning watching the sun with no breaks at all My husband is very kind, he brings a cup of tea and a cake and he's, do you want a break? No, something's really exciting happening. He's like, don't stand there, I'm recording. We'll sit and plan our weekend around the sun. If family wants to come and see us, it's like, can you actually come during this time because it's going to rain? Sometimes they get a bit annoyed. It's like, why can't we just come then? You know, we never see you when it's sunny. We always see you when it's cloudy or wet. There's many times when it's been cloudy for maybe a week or two, and it's like, come on, move, move, move. It almost gets to the point where you think that if I don't see the sun soon, I'm going to get in the shakes. It's sort of like going through withdrawal. The sun is very mysterious in the fact that we don't understand it at all. It's one of the most magnificent structures in the universe. And that's why I like to watch it in my garden.
Alexandra Hart there, one of the uh, um, winners of the our solar system category back in 2014. That was the Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition that we run here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. Now we are beginning to approach the end of the uh, the, the presented part of our live stream for today. Um, this this the clouds have had absolutely fantastic comic timing because every single time I've gone to a video during today's stream, that is the moment that the clouds decide to part and we have a very brief view of the uh, solar eclipse. Um, maybe within the last few minutes of this stream, we'll be granted another view and I'll get the chance to talk about it. But uh, uh, just if you are joining us now, this is our partial solar eclipse a live stream for 2020. We have a view from our Annie Maunder Astrographic Telescope, um, which unfortunately is black at the moment because unfortunately the clouds are not playing ball. But nonetheless, we're hoping that uh, over the course of the next hour, when uh, I'm not going to be directly in front of you, I will, uh, uh, it's going to be a quiet stream for the second half of today. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see something during that. So don't go anywhere just yet. But before we finish the loud part of today's stream, there's just some time to talk about some future events coming up. So we do, of course, have uh, the uh, our summer solstice lecture coming on the 18th of June. Uh, the links for all of that are on our website, RMG. .co.uk. Now we are already running automated planetarium shows here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich and the north site, so the site with the meridian line is open. So if you want to come along, please do go onto our website, book some tickets on there and come along to us. Hopefully, hopefully we will be back on site with the entirety of the site open very, very soon. More details on that over the next week. And before we finish for today, there's just a little bit more time to answer some of the questions that you've had coming in. And we've had questions coming in over our Facebook chat and our YouTube chat. So uh, let's answer some of those. So uh, the next question that we've got is, uh, does the wind get affected by the eclipse? And uh, the answer is yes, uh, to a certain extent. Basically, anything that changes the temperature of our atmosphere by a reasonable amount will have an effect on the wind. But exactly what effect is quite difficult to tell. I'm going to stop there because, yes, we do have a view of the sun coming through our Annie Maunter Astrographic Telescope, which I'm just being told won't last very long. So, again, we have the moon uh, view uh, uh, visible there at the top of our screen. So we've done a bit of a rotation now so that we can see the moon up at the top of our screen and set off to the right-hand side uh, with the disk of the sun. We are almost bang on maximum at this point, um, uh, which is absolutely fantastic. What's also interesting is that we can just about tell on the very edge of the lunar surface, there are in fact some hills, some valleys, some craters, some mountains. The surface of the moon is not smooth, and so you would just about be able to see a sort of a feathering on the edge of the moon. That is actual real features on the surface of the moon that have just disappeared because the clouds have come back. Because of course they have, but at least for a moment there, we were able to see the solar eclipse on our stream. I'll answer some of the other questions that we've had today. I was answering one about, does the wind get affected by uh, an eclipse? The answer is almost certainly yes, to a certain extent, but models of our atmosphere are very, very difficult to test, which is why eclipses are in fact an important part of testing our models and trying to understand exactly what effects they'll have on the atmosphere. Um, uh, one of the questions that we've had is, does the eclipse actually hurt our atmosphere? And the answer to that one is, is basically no. Um, you're covering up the atmosphere for a very short period of time. You're taking a small amount of the sun's light out from the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere. So there's slightly less energy going into it than there normally would be. Um, but in reality, that's not going to have a 
huge effect. Uh, our atmosphere goes through all sorts of different changes over the course of a year with uh, seasons changing, meaning that we get varying amounts of sunlight all the time. So this small change for the course of an hour or so isn't going to have any serious impact. And the, the fact is that these eclipses have been occurring in one shape or another for literally billions of years. So thankfully, it doesn't appear to have caused any damage so far. Um, and finally, uh, a, a fantastic image to end our stream, a uh, fantastic uh, question to end our stream on, particularly given that we can't see the sun today. Um, will the sun die and go out? Well, you could be forgiven for thinking so, considering how dark our stream is looking at the moment. But the answer is that while, yes, the sun does have a lifespan, it's not going to be around for ever. Uh, it will last somewhere between 10 and 12 billion years in total. It's about four and a half billion years into its life. So that makes it almost bang on middle aged. So we've got at least another four and a half to six billion years of the sun being about the same as it currently is, the main part of the sun's lifetime, before there'll be any huge changes. There will be some changes over the course of that time, um, but the sun itself will basically be intact for the, for the whole of that. And one thing to say is that our sun will not explode at the end of its life. It will not go through a supernova. It's just too small for that. It needs to be about seven or eight times more massive than it currently is in order to be able to do that. And that means that we're well below the requirement. Instead, when our sun does finally reach the end of its life, it will puff itself up into a red giant star, large enough to swallow the entirety of the planets Mercury and Venus, and possibly even the Earth. It's unclear at the moment whether it would. It's looking like it probably wouldn't, um, but it would absolutely bake us. Um, so uh, you've got about five or six billion years to decide where you're going to be when that happens and perhaps arrange some accommodation elsewhere in the universe. Although the one good thing about having the sun that big in our sky is it'll be far more difficult for the clouds to get in the way. So who knows, maybe we'd be able to see a little bit more of our sun if we were doing this in about five or six billion years. Although it is worth mentioning the moon won't come even close to blocking out the sun at that point if it even still exists. So that is the end of our loud stream for today. I'm going to be moving in a moment to our quiet stream so we're just going to have the view of the partial solar eclipse such as it is through our Animond astrographic telescope uh, running in the background. Uh, from all of us here at the Royal Observatory Greenwich Thank you very much for joining us, and we hope that you have some luck of your own seeing the partial solar eclipse. Join us again soon.